Welcome to another edition of Alberta's Regiment, Stories from the South Alberta Light Horse. Uh, I am Lieutenant Colonel Retired Robert McKenzie, and with me is uh, Captain uh, Don Gerling, and our special guest today is Justice Russ Dixon uh, from Calgary. And he's here today as our special guest. Uh, it's especially important because Russ is one of the few uh, veterans uh, that we've had an opportunity to interview. Welcome, Justice Dixon. Thank you for having me. Enjoyed the trip down as well. Oh, a beautiful day beautiful, to travel. Beautiful morning sunrise yeah. and lots of geese in the air. So it was quite interesting. Now, uh, Justice Dixon uh, started out in Medicine Hat. And uh, can you give us a little bit of your background, Russ? Well, the, um, the, the, first of all, the Dixons came from Northumberland into the Peterborough country in 1819. And my grandfather and his brother were on a train to Calgary mm -hmm. in 1883. The tracks stopped at Maple Creek. They got off the train, stayed there for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And they were running in the Dixon Brothers store right across from the station in, in Maple, Maple Creek. Creek. Mm -hmm. And my father uh, was uh, at McGill at the 19... 12 to 4 to 15 I think taking medicine met my mother who was a former school teacher and also a nurse at the Montreal General Hospital they secretly married and uh, both of them joined the McGill contingent to France and went overseas in first world war things were going well I think my dad was stationed mostly in, in a hospital in Boulogne and sewing up the soldiers in France. My mother became pregnant with my sister Peggy, had to disclose the marriage. Mm -hmm. They sent her home to have her baby in Montreal. And uh, after the war, my father came to Medicine Hat, I believe in 1920, I would mm -hmm. think, and started practicing medicine in Medicine Hat. At the old General Hospital. At the old General Hospital. And we lived yeah. next door to the old General Hospital for some years in the Dr. Patterson home. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's a doctor from Ontario by the name of Woodland who had built a beautiful brick home on First Street at number 234 First Street, just east of Division Avenue mm -hmm. on the river. And my father fortunately purchased that home in about 1923. I was born in 1924. Had a very happy childhood in Medicine Hat. Well, you mentioned you attended Alexander's uh, school, I did. high school. Toronto Street first. No, yeah. Kitchener. Kitchener Earl first. Kitchener. Earl yeah. Kitchener. Then Toronto Street. Then Connaught for a year, then Alexander, and finished grade 12 in 1942. 42, and that was during the Second World War. It was. And uh, you joined the uh, Canadian Army. Can you uh, tell us a little bit of the background on why you joined in well, that? Um, the, apart from the military background and the family, my brother Charlie joined the Air Force in 1940 and was chasing submarines out of Nova Scotia. My brother John was in the Army taking his medical course at McGill. Mm -hmm. My sister was married to a doctor in the Air Force. <laughs> uh, there was a little bit of inference to think that I should maybe join up myself. And I went to Mount Royal College for a year in Calgary in order to become 18 years of age. And I joined up on July the 13th, 1943. What unit did you join? Well, uh, they, when I joined up, they knew I had a grade 12 education. And at that time, they were what they call the, 
second Canadian Army course at the University of Toronto. And the people that interviewed me when I joined the Army suggested I should attend in a year at university, presumably then go to officer's training uh, at, I forget now where the officers trained in Ontario. In Kingston? In King, no, it was um, yeah. another downstream mm -hmm. from Kingston. So anyway, I ended up at the University of Toronto. Uh, first of all, I took my basic training at Brampton, mm -hmm. just an outskirt of Toronto. A lot of our officers were vets from Dieppe. Mm -hmm. I always remember in the morning, Saturday morning when you get a leave, and they're standing in the morning sunshine with their medals and their beautiful uniforms of all the different uniforms of, of uh, companies and regiments that served at Dieppe. Mm -hmm. It's quite a sight to see those vets. Mm -hmm. And they're, this is what they were doing after having, presumably most have been wounded at mm -hmm. Dieppe. So I get to the University of Toronto. It's all math, it's all physics. It's all chemistry, just a disaster. <laughs> so I decided to leave. So I left uh, at Christmas time and uh, ended up at Camp Ipperwash on Lake Huron mm -hmm. for my advanced infantry training. Mm -hmm. I'd already had my basic. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting in the rec building one day, a bunch of mostly guys from Ontario. Big sign on the wall said, Join the paratroopers and get 75 cents a day danger pay. Big sign. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're making a dollar 25, <laughs> for starters, another 75 cents a day was pretty attractive. Mm -hmm. So about 10 of us signed up when we were finished our advanced training. Off we went to Shiloh, Camp Shiloh, mm -hmm. near Brandon, mm -hmm. Manitoba. Took our parachute training, maybe two months of running around and jumping over walls and you, they put you up on, on towers mm -hmm. and let you float down a few feet and learn how to land properly, which mm -hmm. was very, very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, after doing that for, I guess, a total of about eight weeks, uh, they let you up into an airplane that came from Rivers, Manitoba, about five or no, nine of us would get in a plane and uh, we were all trained to jump out the door. And if you didn't think you should jump, there was a big burly guy standing there that would have thrown you out of the plane. We understood that pretty clearly. <laughs> and after seven jumps, we lined up and we were paraded and granted our parachute wings. Mm -hmm. So I'm ready to go overseas. And uh, I get over to uh, uh, land in Greenwich, Scotland, and down to Aldershot. And uh, I end up with the first Canadian Parachute Battalion, which I'd honestly never heard of <laughs> really before, at uh, Bulford in, in Wiltshire. And uh, because the, we had, this was a, I was joining the 6th British Airborne Division as a single Canadian battalion. Mm -hmm. So there are nine battalions in the division. One was Canadian, all the rest were British, and two of the rest were glider battalions. So because the jumping in England only required one shoot instead of two that we were trained on, on the American style with the backpack on your back and the chest pack and the front. The British packing of the, of the silk and the parachutes was different from the American and you didn't get the big jolt that you do, you're jumping American style. So they got, did away with the chest pack and you only had the good old pack on, on your back. But we, when we jumped, in England, we were trained in Dakotas. Mm -hmm. And um, we, there was a big wire running down the length of the plane. And we would have about 20 to a load of plane load. And you'd line up and put your hook onto this wire. 
you check the guy ahead of you. Everybody checked the person ahead of them. And when the horn blew or light flashed, out you went. So we did a little jumping around England, uh, various schemes, waiting to go somewhere. The, the battalion had jumped D-Day, which was a night jump, mm -hmm. on the eastern side of all the beaches. So the 6th Airborne had the job to protect all those beaches from the east, mm -hmm. coming towards Con from the east. So, um, the, and they, they, they achieved all their objectives uh, the first day. Uh, they, they had to capture two bridges near Con. They had to wipe out a, a big battery of big guns that could force shells onto uh, Juno Beach mm -hmm. and Sword Beach, which are on the east side, mm -hmm. and so on. And they fought from D-Day through to crossing the Seine River, probably about August oh, the 29th or something, just before September, mm -hmm. when they finally threw they went from Caen to Falais, the, the Canadian 2nd mm -hmm. Division and the 3rd Division. 3rd uh, Division landed at D-Day. Mm -hmm. The 2nd um, Infantry landed about J July 1st or something like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the battalion came back to Bulford just about when I arrived. Okay. So we were, we were the novices filling in the ranks. They lost quite a few killed in Normandy, I think 123, mm -hmm. 80 were captured, mm -hmm. and a bunch were, were wounded. So they needed us to fill the ranks, mm -hmm. and we were glad to, to join them. Can you remember the first jump that you ever made uh, in well, Shiloh? In Shiloh? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, you're, you're, you, you've gone through all this the yeah. business on the, uh, on the um, jump towers, jump towers uh, instruction, uh, all kinds of it, and you're really kind of ready for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, just out you go, yeah. and you're, all of a sudden you're floating in the air. And what you got to watch for is the winds around Manitoba and the prairies. Yeah. You, you had to watch and you had to pay attention to where you're going. Cause and the shoots you had, you had were not very steerable. A little bit, a little but bit. partially steerable. Yeah. That's right, the shroud lines. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could steer it a, a little, little bit, yeah. but you couldn't rely on where you're going <laughs> without one. But anyway, I, was, yeah. I had no problem, no broken bones, and Good. I was pleased to do it. So your, uh, the uh, brigade had jumped at D-Day and then came back in and that's when you joined that's them in England. Joined. So we took, as I say, the parachute, English parachute training. We did various jumps. We were right near Stonehenge. We ran through with packs on overnight, 60 miles, all this good athletic stuff, you know. You we, were in, good we were in good shape. <laughs> we were in very good shape. <laughs> so we get on a, a, you've heard of the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. And that started about December the 8th or 9th or something, and the Germans had great success for the first mm -hmm. uh, couple of weeks. Yeah. And uh, they decided to send us in by boat into Belgium. Mm -hmm. And we ended up about 30 miles north of Bastogne, where the, the American 101st Parachute mm -hmm. Division held out and said nuts yes. to the surrender call. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we didn't have too much real fighting to do, but we were there to make sure they, that was the end of their advance. They weren't going to get through to Antwerp, mm -hmm. which was Hitler's object in, in doing that um, penetration into Belgium. So anyway, we, it was bitterly cold. We think Canadian winters are tough enough, but that was something. And uh, we froze, we slept in barns and wherever we could. And anyway, we um, left Belgium and went over to South Holland on the Siegfried Line. And uh, we were there maybe three, four weeks and about February the 27th, we get back on our boat, 
back to Bulford in England. Then our big effort is just coming up very soon. So I had no part in D-Day or mm -hmm. Normandy. Uh, the, uh, on March the 24th, our division and an American division, that's 17th Airborne, got in the Dakota Plains and we had the largest parachute jump, single jump during the war at a place called Wazel on the east side of the Rhine River. Mm -hmm. And I'm told that Churchill uh, and Montgomery were watching the drop from the west side of the river. And I'm told that Churchill had a nice pee in the Rhine River just for good measure, <laughs> which I could see him doing that. So anyway, we had a pretty wild day. Fortunately, it was 10 in the morning, not a night jump. So it was a clear, beautiful morning. There's a lot of bush around. Fortunately, I landed in the bush, went right through to the ground, but nobody was waiting for me on the ground, which was very fortunate. And by the time we got your rifle out of your the, the sleeve that you carry below you as you're going down uh, and get a little bit organized, uh, we spent the day really rounding up surrendering Germans, mostly. Uh, in the meantime, the bridge builders are building bridges across the Rhine River. We protect the east side of the river uh, from attack. And uh, the tanks started to roll in. By the end of the day, uh, the Canadian in or British infantry and tanks had joined us. So we had a successful day. Our colonel was caught up in the high trees, Colonel Nicklin from Blue Bomber fame in football in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. And he was shot up and two or three others as they hung in the trees mm -hmm. and couldn't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. One of our guys won the Victoria Cross that day mm -hmm. from Toronto. He was a medic in my company and a very nice, big, fine guy got shot up in the nose and rescued about four guys from a burning vehicle and was awarded the VC for what he did. Hmm. So we are now a uh, straight infantry, and we are told by, I guess, Churchill to get away from where we were and head up and cut the Russians off at the Baltic Ocean, on the Baltic Ocean. And we took off on, I guess, about the 26th of March, and by May the 3rd, we had arrived at a town of, called Wismar on the Baltic. We'd gone through a number of German cities, firefights at most big cities and going over rivers, but no serious, serious, you know, organized battles. We accepted the surrender of hundreds and hundreds of Germans. The populace were terrified of the Russians. Uh, we opened the gates on the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. I didn't personally, mm -hmm. but uh, B Company, I was in C Company, uh, B Company men did, and I guess it was a, just an appalling mm -hmm. scene of deprivation, death, and everything. And I presume the medics from the 6th Battalion uh, or 6th Division probably attended as many people as they could. Mm -hmm. uh, they're starving, they're ill-kept, just, it was a terrible scene. So, we crossed the Elbe River and uh, ended up, as I say, in this lovely little be seaside town called Wismer. We put up a roadblock on the east side of town, lined up a couple of tanks, we had British tanks. We rode tanks, <laughs> but mostly on foot for 300 miles. Mm -hmm. The lovely countryside, there wasn't a stick, st loose stick anywhere. And the farms were white, beautiful. We'd go in and, and help ourselves. They disappeared when we arrived. <laughs> Steal, uh, knock their chickens on the head and have, we were ahead of our rations half the time. Chickens and preserves in the basements, all the fruit and stuff. So they left them behind? They, left, they took off. 
and they saw no cattle, no horses. Mm -hmm. They must have taken those mm -hmm. with them as well. I even pinched a few pairs of bloomers when my underwear got a little nasty. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I did for underwear. Says, <laughs> they weren't very good quality, <laughs> but served the purpose. Well, uh, during that time, you probably had very little we, washing we facilities. We didn't have hardly and, uh, anything. We were ahead of yeah. everybody, and we're on the move. So we are now in Wismar, and uh, Monty came around one day with a big parade of uh, motorcycle policemen with their red caps and mm -hmm. their brass, and met with General Rokossovsky of the Russian Army. So they had a parade in the middle of town. We're all standing there at attention. Pretty interesting sight to see mm -hmm. that. There wasn't too much vodka going over the table because Monty, of course, didn't want any part of the uh, no. alcohol. A little bit of conniving went back and forth behind the Russian lines, but but not. They were they were tough. They they weren't friendly looking guys, <laughs> and they'd arrive at the east boundary of town on a big fat boar, uh, farmhouse horse with a bouquet of lilacs in one hand and a tommy gun in the other and they were looking for fraud lines mm -hmm. and there's no way that we allowed them to mm -hmm. get anywhere at this time how old were you 19 i was 19 when i was 18 when i joined up yeah i was uh i was 19 yeah. maybe 20 maybe 20 maybe 20 i think 20 and uh, we hung around Wismar uh, for maybe 10 days, packed up all our, the guns that we had collected and cameras that we mm -hmm. sent to send them back to Bullfords, put them in a big canvas, uh, wooden sides and canvas tops, gave them to the Navy, I guess, and never saw them again. <laughs> so we, we get to England, and we uh, had volunteered to go to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So we had to leave in England. So by this time... Uh, uh, VE Day, was, VE Day yeah. was May 8th. Yeah, okay. So we're now in England probably... Well, we left, we arrived in Halifax on June the 15th. Mm -hmm. the first, on the first troop ship back to Canada with a full battalion mm -hmm. on it. So, well, you must have been one of the first battalions. You were lucky you were in that because it used to be first in, last out, or last well, in. Well, I was already overseas yeah. 10 months. Yeah. 10 months. Some guys have been there for five years. Yes. So we were going to the Pacific. Yeah. So we ended up at Niagara in the Lake mm -hmm. in a tent camp, waiting to go to some island for jungle training, we thought. Then the bombs dropped, mm -hmm. and that was pretty well the end of, of end my of war. war. End of my war. How long was it uh, once the uh, the atomic bomb dropped uh, before you were released from the military? Well, I, th I think it was about the 15th of September, the time and I ended up at the University of Alberta before the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was, I was very fortunate. I think I maybe jumped 20 times out mm -hmm. of an airplane. No bones broken, no no, no wounds, no heroics, mm -hmm. just being there, mm -hmm. you know? Well, being part of history. You, you go where you're told. Yeah. You keep your head down yeah. and you don't, don't, volunteer. don't, you don't volunteer to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With your, uh, I'm interesting, interested about uh, the change in your jumping um, rig yeah. that you started in Canada with and then the British um, changed over. And one of the stories that I recently uh, looked at talked about a, some, a sack almost like a um, uh, sleeping bag that the British had uh, designed and you put all your stuff in to jump out of it. Did, were you trained with that? I heard there was not much success with it, that most people lost them. But uh, is, are you speaking that? of weapons? It was it was to put all your gear in, and then and well, it was attached to your. The, well, to we the, had the we had jump smocks, we had smocks, camouflage smocks, camouflage helmets, um, our usual battle dress or webbing, um, pack on the back, 
pack on the no pack on the front. Uh, we our rifles or bearing guns, you put in a felt sleeve, uh, hanging on your webbing, and dangling below you as you're descending towards the ground. You had to be careful you didn't tangle up with your own uh, wife. If you're carrying a Sten gun or a Tommy gun, you just cradle that in your arms. I was a rifle guy. Um, I don't really recall anything bundling up in big, big bunches. Most of the heavy stuff would come in by glider. Mm -hmm. You know, they had, I think the odd Jeep would be brought in by gliders, small, small anti-tank mm -hmm. and, and ammunition. We all carried extra Bren gun ammunition for the Bren gunners. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than that, I don't know about any special packaging. You didn't uh, drop anything below you, so it hit the ground before. Yeah, you your drove. rifle was dangling yeah. about eight feet below oh, you on a, yeah. on a cord mm -hmm. in this, this felt that's sleeve. That's what yeah. about. Maybe yeah. that's what they're talking about. Maybe that's what it was. Did, yeah. did most of you were successful. And, uh, you know, a Bren gun it? would take a much bigger sleeve than a rifle. Yeah. And uh, yeah, okay. yeah. So, and we jumped. To, uh, hard to say, elevation-wise, but let's say maybe 900 feet when you start out. By the time the last guy out of the, got out of the plane, probably 600 feet, not very far off the ground. Very you don't sun, you don't uh, sightsee on the way down. <laughs> you know, you just don't have the time. No. You don't have the time. Anyway, it was a pretty exciting day, yeah, particularly that one day. So you've been in the military, you're uh, about 20, 21 years old. Uh, you're yeah. out of the uh, out of the army now and you go to the University of Alberta. Yeah. And what did you take then? Well, I, I because of my family background in medicine, mm -hmm. I went into pre-med. Mm -hmm. I received a BSc in 1948 and there were probably 500 guys, mostly veterans, looking for a slot in medical school, about 40, 40 opportunities. So I didn't get into medical school. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I better consider going into law school. So I went to see the dean of the Alberta Law School. And he, because I had a BSc, he didn't want me. Mm -hmm. He wanted BAs or BCOMs. <laughs> so I knew that. BC had opened up a law school in 1947. Mm -hmm. I got on the phone to the law faculty in Vancouver, said, I have a BSc from Alberta. Can I come and join you? They said, come on out. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I went to UBC. Mm -hmm. And I met a guy by the name of Bill Dickey that uh, you may have heard of, uh, he ended up in Lougheed's cabinet. Mm -hmm. He was there uh, from Calgary. And uh, we were uh, discussing the opportunity of going back to Alberta. We were Albertans. And at that time, it might cost $2,500 if you graduated in BC and admitted to the BC bar, then to transfer back to Alberta. Just a kind of a big number. So we both thought we might try and go back to Alberta for third year law. But the dean remembered me and made me take a summer school in arts before he let me back into oh. Alberta. So I did graduate from Alberta with two degrees, mainly a BSc and an LLB in 1951. How did Came your, to Calgary. How did your uh, uh, military experience help you in uh, going back? You mentioned that you were in the University of Toronto. You weren't too impressed with what was happening there or the courses you were taking. Oh, How, uh, that, that short amount of time that you were involved in the uh, uh, military overseas, how did it prepare you better for your school? Well, you've lived a little, eh? Uh, you're not a school kid anymore. Uh, you've seen a lot of country, you've seen guys getting killed and wounded and, and so on. I think you just generally mature and uh, you have a sense that uh, you've done your job for your country and it's time to 
get serious about doing something for the rest of your life. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it was a helpful experience. Uh, it was um, good training, good discipline. We had wonderful uh, sergeants, mostly, uh, and officers. And the, the whole battalion was just a special place for me. And we had a wonderful association after the war. We had numerous re reunions, uh, well supported. And um, I've kept up my interest in the, um, in the military, uh, particularly parachute uh, area. We meet uh, once a year at D-Day, and we have a, a mountain named for us on the David Thompson Highway west of, mm -hmm. of Red Deer, going through the mm -hmm. Saskatchewan River crossing. We have a monument there. We have a barbecue after the parade. Uh, I got uh, Lieutenant Colonel or Lieutenant Governor Lois Mitchell and her husband mm -hmm. to come this year, and they spoke to us, mm -hmm. and uh, we put up our get on our garb, put up our medals, and have a day of remembrance mm -hmm. once a year. So it's been a just a good thing for me to have gone through that training overseas. So you got back to Alberta. Yeah. Uh, took your last year at University of Alberta. Yep. And uh, now you're a qualified lawyer. What did you do? Well, I came to Calgary. Mm -hmm. I, I left Medicine Hat in 1942 and really never came back to stay. I mean, I was away at university, mm -hmm. come back maybe in the summer f for a couple of weeks. So I arrived in town and uh, there was a, a a small law firm, two lawyers, called Cairns and Howard. And you may have heard of Bill Howard. Oh, Bill Howard, I knew Bill. him well. I was an aide de camp. Well, I was the first student at the firm. <laughs> and Jimmy Cairns was appointed to the Supreme Court of Alberta partway through my articles. Mm -hmm. So I transferred my articles to Bill Howard. Mm -hmm. And I was with him for 29 years. Oh. <laughs> and I saw a lot of what a hard-working lawyer lives like and looks like and acts like. And a hard-working uh, lawyer, too. <laughs> he was the workaholic. I have never seen his like. And he would work all week, go home Saturday, go to bed about 7 o'clock Saturday nights to bank his sleep, then go to the armories every Sunday and all day Sunday, then back in the office at six or something Monday morning, mm -hmm. just incredible. Best, best corporate lawyer in Western Canada. Mm -hmm. So I was a bencher of the Law Society. I was elected a bencher in 1973 or 72. I was granted my Queen's Council in 1973. What is Queen's Council? Well, it's a special award in the legal profession, uh, generally mainly for barristers that exceed in the profession in their trial work, etc. Maybe kind of a, a social professional sort of an award from from the government uh, government of Alberta. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an it's an honor mm -hmm. that you most lawyers cherish. I was on the benches till um, 1980. And I was uh, asked to go on the Supreme, the Court of Queen's Bench of Alberta in, in October 1980. Best thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. what, what is the Court of Queen's Bench? It's the, the senior trial and criminal court in Alberta. Uh, there's two levels. There's the provincial court, which your judges are appointed by Edmonton. Mm -hmm and Queen's Bench, appointed by Ottawa, and over everybody is the Court of, Court of Appeal. Mm -hmm. So I was one of about 80 on the Court of Queen's Bench and sat many times in the favorite courthouse of Medicine Hat. Uh, this morning, I, I asked the girl, I took a bunch of, of law books 
to the courthouse library this morning, mm -hmm. about 50 of them to get rid of them mm -hmm. out of my basement. And uh, the nice gal there that looked at us in the door let me go into the, the best courtroom in Alberta in the Medicine Hat upstairs, floor number two. Mm -hmm. I even went up on the bench, <laughs> sat there, and somebody took my picture <laughs> this morning. Many, many times did I sit there. Yeah, there's what they called Southern Duty. It come from Calgary to Medicine Hat for a couple of days over to Lethbridge, mm -hmm. sit there and then end up back in Calgary. We sat everywhere in the province, not mm -hmm. um, semi-big places. You know, Red Deer, um, uh, Peace River, Fort McMurray, mm -hmm. um, those kind of towns mostly. Loved it. I'd take my shotgun in the fall and my golf clubs in, in the spring. <laughs> And I didn't sit around in motels mm -hmm. by myself. So that's what I, I did. It's nice to hear that you, uh, that you have a special appreciation for the court, that courtroom number one in the courthouse. I've given it's evidence beautiful. there on beautiful. many occasions. Beautiful. I think I may have even given evidence in your court. Were you in that prisoner's box or no? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so no, no, I wasn't. I was <laughs> I had 37 years as a police officer, medicine hat. So, oh, uh, yeah. Yes. And uh, so. Well, Your name has my, been on many, of, many my, a document that I've My dad read. left here in 53 to, for Calgary, to retire in Calgary. My sister was there, and my brother John practiced medicine with dad here for a couple of years, and then he moved and lived right beside me in Calgary. Two brick houses with a medicine hat brick. We wanted to build them with our local brick mm -hmm. and anyway my dad moved up there and, but he passed away in the hospital in 1956 mm -hmm. so he didn't have much of a holiday or retirement yeah but he was a, a Maple Creek boy and uh, we used to spend a lot of time on that road from here to Maple Creek with the gophers on the road and the heat waves coming up and mother would get car sick and all you know the <laughs> the usual stuff but i'm a great fan of this town mm -hmm. and i wrote about it um called the hat the creek in the hills yeah. and um just the best growing up ever we used to shoot 22s out of our out of our window back window and, you know the river banks just behind us mm -hmm. You wouldn't do that now, would you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Policeman? I'm afraid not. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But the river, we were on the river all the time. You know, the ice company mm -hmm. used to be yeah, uh, three where, doors. Where City Hall is. It used to be gas city. No, 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 no. You're no, about no. Yeah. On Division Avenue. Yeah. The oh. ice company. Yeah. And we go up in the sleighs in the wintertime and snoop around, you know, as kids. One time I walked in the wrong place and went down in the river. But, but, but old Bill Williamson, who was the boss guy, had a big pole in his hand with a hook. And I had a little belt on the back of my little coat. He just put the hook on that belt and just yanked me out of the water and made me run home all the way, because I had it frozen. Yeah. I was <laughs> mad as hell at him. <laughs> And we'd go skating down on that river and in the winter time because the flood Chinooks would flood the river. Mm -hmm. We go after jackrabbits and 22s in our back. You get a little cold. You take your skate and you poke a hole. You look for a bump in the ice. Poke a hole in the top of that. Get on a match. Light the fire. Sit there and warm your hands. Coming out of the river. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I never heard that's a, that's an interesting story. Well, maybe you one. should still be able to do that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the methane or uh, it's methane, yeah, acid. come up through yeah. the river. Hmm. Oh, that's hmm? uh, that's a different story. But I remember down at First Street used to be the Gas City Planing Mill. Oh yeah, Mr. Burns, the, uh, Mr. Burns, Mr. Burns, and uh, the Empress Theater. The Empress Theater and right. the Monarch yeah. Theater yeah. and uh, the, the Roxy, wasn't there a Roxy yeah. Theater? Yeah, there was a Roxy. Yeah. I, knew, I knew all the 
Yeah. All the all the professional men, all the lawyers, mm -hmm. all the doctors. We'd have many do dinners at home, and the doctors would come and they sit in the no booze in our house, mm -hmm. but they'd sit with good cigars mm -hmm. and good food and talk about the, the you know. I sent a picture to the to the Esplanade. Esplanade. Little Esplanade. Mm -hmm. A little little while ago, of all the doctors. They were in the hat when my dad was practicing here. Mm -hmm. Good looking bunch. Yeah. And they were good professionals. Well. Yeah. Loved it here. Well, good. Is there any particular story on that booklet that you wrote that comes to mind uh, that you would like uh, our viewers to see or hear about? Uh, well, I've, I've actually I've written three books, mm -hmm. not books. They're, well, The Hat, The Creek, and The Hills mm -hmm. is the, growing up in the 30s mm -hmm. in Medicine Hat. And it was about 10,000 people and um, knew pretty well everybody and went, went to the movies on Saturday morning, you know, mm -hmm. and go to Sarge's and buy the jawbreakers and mm -hmm. stuff. and of what kids do, uh, have fights on the riverbank and and with use use garbage can lids as a shield and throw oh. rotten tomatoes mm -hmm. at your, you know, the other guy. Yeah. And uh, so that's all in there, plus uh, the story of my family. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it's just such a great city. I hope Everybody still feels that way oh. today. Well, I was born in Medicine Hat, yeah. and I'm still here. And my my dad came here in 1914. In fact, his Boy Scout troop planted the trees in Central Park. It did, eh? And, well, uh, he'd have known my father. Yeah. Oh, he knew his father. yeah. Yeah, and uh, my mother was active. Uh, you know, she's a ska figure skater and and a golfer and Chautauqua. And, uh, I even took took a tap dance lesson from Marjorie Coulter mm -hmm. for a year. Do you remember Marjorie Coulter? No, no, I, I yeah. don't remember her. Don't know what I was doing, but anyway, <laughs> I tried it. So um, I just have such a, and, and the hunting. Uh, I don't even remember Frank Anderson. Mm -hmm. Anderson Insurance yeah. Agency, Frank and I had 22s probably when we were 12 or 14. We used to know every magpie and crow nest for 20 miles around the city. And my dad had been given a, a Model A Ford car about 1933 to pay a medical bill. And the kids had the use of the car. <laughs> we went all over the country. Mm -hmm. And in the fall, we go to Tilly and Brooks after partridge and pheasants and go to Many Island Lake, um, wonderful time. Mm -hmm. Go out to boys camp, Cubs and Scouts at Elkwater Lake, freeze out there, you know, mosquitoes and stuff. <laughs> but we did it all. No, it's, it's a good place to grow up and it still is. Although and good it's, teachers, uh, good little... teachers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have missed it. When what I, uh, you were Court of Queen's Bench. Uh, yeah. Is there, uh, what's, maybe an unfair question, what's the most interesting case you dealt with during that time? You must have dealt with a lot yeah, of Yeah, we them, dealt with everything. Yeah, yeah jury trials and, and mm -hmm. uh, criminal trials, fraud trials. I had a, a case um, in Calgary that, um, it was kind of a family sort of a fight. And um, th there was a lady that lived in Texas and felt that her brother had been stealing money or something from family fund. He was in the baking business, it seems to me, in Calgary. And uh, I just had such good witnesses, uh, particularly a lady doctor that came from Cranbrook for the trial. And it was so interesting to see the interplay between these same members of the family mm -hmm. and, and decide, you know, who, who, who are you going to make the right, correct decision for? And uh, I always remember the 
this little lady standing up in, in uh, the, the witness box being cross-examined and just handling the, the lawyer just like a little pro, you know. <laughs> it, it, was, it was great to see. That's a big responsibility to be a judge. It was a great job. One of the yeah. best, best you could do for your province, mm -hmm. really. And we had a good bunch. Mm -hmm. We were well led by chief justices, and we worked hard mm -hmm. and saw the country and learned learned to deal with the people of the country mm -hmm. of the province. Yeah. Has the law changed quite a bit since when you first uh, oh, yeah. came? I mean, uh, the Charter yeah. of Rights and Freedoms changed the whole criminal law, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, uh, they say it isn't any fun anymore. I don't know about being in a firm. Now, they're all getting so big. Mm -hmm. They amalgamate with Ontario firms. It's impersonal. Mm -hmm. You don't really have the same... We, I, when I ended up, we had 34, which is pretty good size uh, for a Western firm. Mm -hmm. But you knew everybody, mm -hmm. and uh, apparently that isn't there anymore no. to enjoy. So the law, laws, are not, not a, I don't think I'd enjoy it as much <laughs> as I did when I, I was there. I think there are a lot of jobs. I've talked to a lot of people that are like that. Uh, uh, no matter what profession you talk to, they seem to have taken a lot of the uh, fun out of, out yeah, of the profession. That's right. I mean, I, I tried to have a little fun on the bench and did a few mischievous things, mm -hmm. I guess. Like, for example, I was sitting in, in um, Grand Prairie in the spring. I had my golf clubs there. I was just in April. And the front nine of the local golf course was open, but the second nine mm -hmm. was not going to open for a week or two. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's too bad that I won't have a chance to play that back <laughs> nine before I go back to Calgary on the Friday, you know, at the end of the week. So I got hold of the local bar guy that I knew a little bit. We cranked up an order addressed to the greenskeeper of the Grand Prairie Golf Course. <laughs> directing him to open the golf course at 3.30 on Thursday, the blank day of April. Mm -hmm. so I signed the order. He entered the order in the courthouse, <laughs> put the stamp on it, <laughs> served the groundskeeper, four of us teed off at 3.30 the next day. <laughs> now that's what you can... Yeah. So instead of being known for the quality of my judgments in the North, I was known as the guy that opened up the Grand Prairie Golf Course early. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said that to me two years later at Peace River. Well, but there's the guy that opened up. Could you imagine that happening now? I mean, uh, uh, the humor's gone out of society. Well, too, I'll tell you saying. about one other that was funny. I had a guy in front of me that uh, from Quebec, and maybe 30 years old, and he apparently had got uh, too much beer in him, and was walking along one of the main roads in Calgary on a sunny afternoon and got hit by a car. He's kind of crossing mm -hmm. an area where he shouldn't have been walking. So anyway, he was suing for his damages. Mm -hmm. And nice enough looking guy, little, little mustache and everything. And he got talking about what he liked to do because he, he couldn't do them anymore. And that's some of the sources of his claims for damages. One of them was that he was a moose hunter and he liked to go out of Red Deer every year and get his, get his moose. Well, of course, he couldn't do that anymore, but he said, I was very good at moose hunting. I said, well, I suppose you learned to call a moose. He says, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, would, would, do you think you could give us a little demonstration of a moose call? He's standing in the witness box. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the garden were killing themselves, <laughs> La laughing at this deal. And it's all being recorded. So I got hold of the tape, took it up to the where the judges have their lunch, and said to everybody, excuse me, I just want to play a little something for you. And you tell me 
if you can, you know, say what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Off comes the boost call. Nobody, nobody <laughs> of course, could have any idea. <laughs> and I still see the clerks that were sitting with me that day <laughs> reminding me of the uh, Mr. Labonte and his moose calls. <laughs> that's, that's a little of the fun you, yeah. you can work in if you do it right. Yeah. Well, is there anything else you would like to... Uh, I think I've pretty well covered pretty well everything that's happened yeah. to me. Well, I've got, got a wonderful wife and uh, 65 years of marriage and three nice kids and my first Great grandchild was born this summer. Great grandchild. Yeah, great grandchild. So that's something happening. Nice mm -hmm. little lady. Yeah. So things have been very good. And you're in good shape. I play tennis twice a week. I play golf a couple times a week. You a good golfer? No, I'm a bad golfer, <laughs> and I'm I'm upset that I can't move the ball <laughs> like I used to. Yeah. It's very depressing. <laughs> I'm a better tennis player than I am a, a golfer. I used to play at the Medicine Hat golf course. Yeah. yeah. The Medicine I, Hat. You weren't playing at Connaught when it well, was in no, Kensington. No, the, uh, the old folks in early yeah. days played at the Medicine Hat. Yeah. I'm not even sure that Connaught was built when I was in the 30s. No, it may not have been. But it was where Kensington is now. It's where what? St. Mary's School. Oh, is it? Uh, where St. Mary's School was, was the clubhouse, and that was the front nine, and the back nine was where Kensington is. Oh, really? And there used to be a swinging bridge going across the coulee. I remember the Babin Club. Did you ever remember the Babin Club down down in, in the flats? Yeah. Used to go down and chase a bird around? Yeah. Yeah. But... Uh, Russ, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to uh, enjoy your experiences. Had a great time as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I think when my time to go, my ashes are going right off that bridge and maybe they'll settle in Lizzie Island. Mm -hmm. Do you know where Lizzie yeah. Island is? Right off Division Avenue. Yeah. Used to wade there or fish there. Mm -hmm. Many times. On behalf of Alberta's Regiment, thank you very much for joining us and thank you uh, Justice Dixon for your very interesting recollections. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure to come down. I should mention there was one other medicine hatter in the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion and his name was Jim McGarry. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. And his father ran a taxi business mm -hmm. and was right next to Crystal Dairy. Mm -hmm. I used to walk by every time I went to Alexander High School through the laneway, yeah. and I never met Jim overseas. Mm -hmm. I've always regretted that, and he's now gone. Mm -hmm. I knew his son. Did you? Yeah. Jim's son? Yeah. I yeah. didn't. He was in Edmonton. Yeah. And I'm... Pleasure to meet you, and the Mackenzie family are yeah. well known around this town. Yeah. Well, this thank town. you very much. Yeah. Very good. Pleasure, sir.